And welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Are you bothered with winter allergies? Or is it East Tennessee sinus? Or is it a common cold? Is it due to dogs and cats or dust and mold or cockroaches? Is it due to the environment? Do you have food allergies? We'll be spending most of this show talking about winter allergies. Allergies in the winter months of the year or is it really not allergies? My guest is Dr. Ty Prince. Dr. Prince is a board certified allergist and he'll be answering our questions. Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Overholt and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes on the Dr. Bob Show. Later on, we'll be talking about the power of statin drugs and also that dry winter skin. Is it causing cracking? Is it interfering with your life? Is it painful? We'll be talking about how to keep your skin soft and smooth like a baby. A lot of information for you. You'll want to stay tuned. We're talking with Dr. Ty Prince, board certified allergist and immunologist, and we're talking about winter allergies, or is it something else? Ty, welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Thank you, Dr. Bob. How common are winter allergies? Uh, very common, especially and, in this part of the country. Uh, when somebody has winter allergies, what do you think of? What causes them? Well, the most common cause would probably be dust mites. That's the most common allergy that we have out there, and, and indoor out dust mite levels are usually pretty high this time of the year. So we've got dust mites, name me two or three others that can cause problems in the winter months. Well, certainly year. pet dander is a, is a, is a common cause. Uh, also cockroach uh, can be that as well too. Mold cause problems in the and, winter? And mold, yes, depending on how much moisture you have in your house and whether or not there might be water damage or anything like that going on. Do they give similar symptoms to somebody that's just got a bummer for a nose? Yeah. Uh, they can. I mean, obviously, with allergies, you're going to have more itchy, watery, sneezy type symptoms with your with your indoor allergies. So let's go. Let's talk about dust mite allergy. That sounds terrible, but most people are used now to understanding the word dust mite. Mm -hmm. What kind of allergies does it cause, and where do you find them? Well, they're mostly found in in mattresses, pillows, upholstered furniture is a common place. Uh, carpeting. It's going to affect you more in your furniture and especially in your bedding where you spend more time, but they're very, very tiny critters. We're actually allergic to the droppings of these critters and they make 30 to 50 droppings a day. You'll find anywhere from a half a million to 10 million in your mattress. So they they produce a lot of allergen. Whoa, and every day they'll put out 22 little pellets. That's right. So they accumulate more and more. They, they do the same thing in the pillow that they do in the mattress? Absolutely, but there's a lot more in the mattress. We have a lot of our patients, we'll tell them to put pill and mattress covers on and they'll try to skimp and just put them on the pillows, pillows and the mattress is probably the highest level of dust mite in the home anywhere. So how about a box spring? Do you, is the box spring involved in that or mainly just the mattress? You'll have some in the box spring. It's going to be a lot more in the mattress. It's going to depend on how thick the mattress is. Obviously the mattress is closer to the person, but we do recommend with precautions and avoidance to cover both of them. So if somebody is allergic to dust mite droplet that we have, what symptoms does it usually cause? Well, allergy symptoms in general are going to be more itchy, watery, stuffy type symptoms. Most dust allergic patients have a lot of AM symptoms, early morning awakening symptoms because they're in heavy levels of dust mites. Uh, so you're going to hear them clear their throat in the morning. You're going to hear their, him, have them, uh, they'll have a stuffy nose, but they'll see a lot more symptoms upon awaking after the whole night of exposure of, to these dust mites. So they think it's just maybe they've been sleeping at nighttime and don't recognize that right. it's dust allergy? I think so. So does it clear up as the day goes on if they don't take medicines or does it stay stuffy from the evening exposure? Yeah, a lot of that depends on how bad the allergies uh, to dust mites are and also whether or not you might have other allergies. Those dust mite allergies, if they get stirred up in the morning and you happen to be allergic to some of the outdoor pollen, you can see a larger reaction to the other allergens 
if you've already gotten stirred up to that dust mites in the beginning. So we sort of say that primes the nose That's for exactly other right. things to have problems. Well, what if somebody has a sinus infection or common cold? What are they like in the morning? Well, the, you know, the cold comes on much more rapidly. It tends to be more all over symptoms. Uh, for me personally, the antihistamines don't help me a bit when I have a cold, but when I have allergies, they seem to be fairly effective. Uh, allergies are not contagious, so if other members of the house happen to be <laughs> suffering from an allergy, what they think is an allergy attack at the same time, that's probably more likely to be a cold. But the colds are going to go away in four to seven days. Allergies, depending on how long you're exposed, are more likely to, to stay there. Uh, also, you'll see very often a seasonal or locational pattern. Uh, you might just have cold symptoms in the spring and the fall. That's more likely to be allergies. Uh, you might have more, quote, cold symptoms when you go to your grandmother's house and they have three cats. Uh, that might be more likely to be an allergy in that symptom that situation. Back to dust mite allergy. Person wakes up, they've got a lot of nasal symptoms. The worst nasal symptom would be itchy, sneezy, or stuffy and congestion. Stuffy is going to cause you the most problems because you're not going to get a good night's rest that way. So uh, it causes you can't sleep. Does it? So is dust allergy a reason for feeling tired during the day? Absolutely. Is it lack of sleep, or is it the allergic reaction, or is it both? Well, a little bit of both. You know, you can feel fatigue from allergies because the body, it's an inflammatory response, and the body will sometimes react that way. But I think most people who have a blocked nose at night, they don't go into good deep sleep. They don't get that good restful sleep because they can't breathe very well. And the brain doesn't like that. The brain wants to relax and have a nice good airflow. We'll have patients turn on a ceiling fan sometimes so they'll feel like they're getting better airflow. But the brain likes that nice continuous airflow and then they'll go into a nice deep uh, sleep state when that happens. If somebody has a stuffy nose and congestion, wake up in the morning, have to clear their throat, sneeze, itch. Can it cause other problems such as sinus infections, such as snoring, such as even asthma? Sure, uh, those are the common complications we see with allergies. And very often as those allergies progress, you see more of those complications as well too. So how does an allergy in the nose cause ear problems and sinus problems? Well, the, sinus ears, infections. the ears are just like an extra sinus. So ear infections are really sinusitis to some degree. They hurt a lot more because they're very tender there. But, you know, they are more likely, the allergies are more likely to cause swelling, cause blockages when the, within those sinuses. But also your immune system goes down just a little bit with allergies and it's not as good as fighting the second invader. So that combination of blocked sinuses and ear canals and also the immune system going down, you'll see more sinus infections very commonly there too. What about asthma? Can dust allergy, dust mites cause asthma? Absolutely. Very are, common cause of asthma. What are the symptoms? Well, symptoms of asthma, are the most common symptoms are going to be chest tightness and wheezing. Uh, but not all asthmatics wheeze. Some of them just cough. It's usually a dry cough, but those patients are going to be restricted in their airways, especially when they exhale. It's going to restrict their exercise as well, too. If they try to go out and run, they're going to tighten up and be short of breath, maybe just at the beginning of their exercise as opposed to toward the end. Uh, but chest tightness and wheezing are the most common symptoms we're going to see. So we get stuffy nose and drainage and congestion. We get blocked head, we can't breathe good, we don't feel good. That's when our allergies it can even cause wheezing, blocked ears, blocked sinuses. Sounds miserable. Absolutely. How, how do we treat it? Well, you can certainly, our best treatment or most, uh, what we try to do first is to avoid it, but dust mites are almost impossible to avoid. Uh, the most effective avoidance measure is pill, our pill and mattress covers, but uh, they're only effective to a degree because you're getting exposure elsewhere. What kind of mattress covers? Uh, you need impermeable mat mattress covers. You can get specialized ones that are impermeable to the dust mite, but still let, let air flow through there. Those tend to be very expensive, especially the good ones. Or you can use the, the plastic covers. They're not very comfortable to sleep on, and they usually tear. They usually are inexpensive. So it's better to get a good one that's permeable, that breathes, 
So that's avoidance, medications to take for a dust mite allergy? Well, medications, obviously antihistamines would be the most common medicine you would take. Uh, you have all these are over the counter now, or the majority are over the counter. You said they don't help you. Well, they can, they can help to some degree. Uh, but the most effective medicines are the nasal steroids by far. And the nasal steroids do what in quickly? Well, they're going to decrease the inflammation, decrease the swelling in the nasal passage, and they're going to dramatically decrease the reaction within the nasal passage, which is where it starts. Name a couple of the cortisone well, nasal sprays. A couple of them over the counter right now are Flonase and Nasacort. You also have Omneris and, and uh, Zatona and Nasonex. A lot. There's and 10 or 12 out there. So that takes away the inflammation, the patient's able to breathe, they feel better. Does it get rid of the allergy? Absolutely not. You're, you're and, treating the symptoms and that's it. And how do we get rid of the allergy? If you want to, there's two ways to get rid of allergies. Totally eliminate the exposure. So with dust mite, we'd have to move them to a very dry part of the country. Or you can immunize against the dust mites. And these are allergy shots? Allergy shots, yes sir. And we're going to be talking about that later. but. Let's find out some other complications of winter allergies and what else can cause them. We're talking with Dr. Ty Prince, board certified allergist, and we've been talking about dust allergy due to dust mites, up to 10 million in a mattress. We have to cover the mattresses. We take medications best at nighttime before you go to sleep, perhaps the intranasal, Cortisone sprays are the best because they take care of the inflammation of the allergic reaction, which can cause ear infections, sinus infections. Uh, the allergic reaction can cause asthma. Serious problem, isn't it? Absolutely. And so how many people, uh, what percent of people do you think have allergies probably? 25-30% uh, have documented allergies where you actually do the test and the exam and, and can document. East Tennessee, I think half the, the population thinks they have allergies. Yeah, and if 30% if do, and half of them think they do, what is the other problem? Just a bummer for the nose from pollution, vasomotor rhinitis? Absolutely, you're gonna have complications of, of, of weather changes, barometric pressure changes, pollution, bad indoor and outdoor pollution, uh, cigarette smokers, et cetera. Um, East Tennessee is notorious for, for a lot of temperature and barometric pressure changes. And you can have, in addition to mold allergies, you can have mold sensitivities where you have high levels of mold that will irritate the airways. So let's jump over to dog dander and cat dander. They're a nemesis to all patients because we love our dogs Absolutely. and we love our cats. Absolutely. So let's talk about a cat allergy. Tell me about a cat allergy. Well, cat allergy is about 10 times more common than dog allergy. It's a more potent allergen. We now consider it a ubiquitous allergen because we find high levels of cat dander in homes that don't have cats and also in uh, schools and other government buildings, churches, where there are no cats to be seen or to be found, but there's high cat dander levels. How does it get there? Well, we think two ways. One, we think it's carried in on people's clothing, but there are some interesting articles and studies uh, that I studied a long time ago showing there's actually high cat dander levels in the home next door to cat owners. And interestingly, it's near the area where facing the side where the cat owner actually is and also where that outdoor air comes in. So we think also it comes in from the outside in. So if somebody has a cat in the house uh, and they keep the cat in the living room and keep it out of the upstairs bedroom, does that solve the problem? That usually does not solve the problem, no. The, if the, the cat comes in to eat or the cat is allowed to watch television with the family and then he's out uh, during the night, does that solve the problem? No, not usually, no, sir. And what is the problem then with cat dander? Well, cat dander stays airborne for a long time. It collects in your furniture and your carpeting and even in your central air system. So it just recirculates, but it's, a, it's an amazing allergen. It's very tiny. It stays airborne for a long time, and it does a great job of getting into our airways to cause allergies. Can we immunize or desensitize or Absolutely. build up tolerance with, with allergy desensitizing? Yes. Do we have to get the cat out of the house if the person just won't do it? How do you handle their symptoms? Same medicines as dust allergy? Uh, yes, that's correct. We use the same medications. We try to 
at least in severe cases, keep the cat out of the bedroom and off the furniture, maybe keep it in an area of the house that, that has solid flooring and, and no upholstered furniture. Uh, but you know that, that's another good case for using immunotherapy. If we can't get rid of the pet, then we can change the reaction the patient has to the animal. So now immunotherapy can change the reaction. What's immunotherapy? Is this allergy shots? Allergy shots, yes. How do they work? Well, we simply take the antigen, the allergen, uh, mix it in very diluted amounts, and then build it up very gradually where not only the patient will build up tolerance, they'll actually be immunized against that allergen where they just don't react to it any longer. So there is hope for somebody that wants to keep their cat, you can immunize them. Right. What about the person that's allergic to cats, doesn't have a cat in their house, but every time they visit Aunt Lucy, and Aunt Lucy has cats, They'll, what do you do in that case? Well, we certainly try to pre-treat them before they get the exposure. Uh, we have a lot of people that visit from out of town and most of those people cannot spend the night. If they're allergic to cats and there's a cat in the house, they can't spend the night there. Uh, but you can pre-treat them before they go in. But that's a good point. You, even if you got rid of the cat in your house, you're still gonna get exposed to it elsewhere. So we're not gonna fix the problem by getting rid of the animals. Uh, we're gonna fix the problem by immunizing the person against them so that when they go other places, they won't react either. Cat dander, cats, can they cause asthma? Absolutely, very common cause of asthma. So nasal problems, asthma, let's go to dogs. Are dog, you said they're not quite as bad as cats. How they're, bad are they? They're, they can be. You can be highly allergic to dogs sometimes, but they, it, 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 cat allergy is 10 times more common than, than dog allergy. And when you study the allergen, you find out why. It does, it's not as allergenic as, as cat dander is. But I think the other thing that's neat with dogs is you really don't have to wash them. You can just rinse them off. It rinses the dander off. So regular rinsing the dog. My dog, we throw a, a stick out into the pool and he runs out and chases it. <laughs> and we've gotten rid of his dander for a few hours anyway. So if you don't have a pool and you need to hose down the dog, mm -hmm. how often do you have to hose it down? Well, at least every two or three days. Okay, uh, so it's frequent that you need to do that yes, to, cut, do. to cut down on the dander. Uh, winter allergies, dogs, cats, cockroaches. Somebody yes. tell me cockroaches can cause our, our patients don't like to hear about cockroach allergy because they think that we think they have cockroaches in their home. Uh, it's the skeletons and the droppings of the cockroach. So it, you can actually have them uh, outside your house uh, and maybe even with a good exterminator, they might die at the periphery of the house, but that, those, that cockroach uh, allergen will still get into the house. And when we carry bags and things, uh, 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 materials that have been stored in warehouses and things, it's gonna have some cockroach antigen on it too. How about cockroaches in inner city apartments, yes. uh, big cities? It's big problem, big it, health problem. Uh, health problem with asthma and allergies and sinus problems. Absolutely. You know, it's, we need to do a better job on that in our inner cities. Now, back to immunotherapy, does it work for dogs and Absolutely. cats? Absolutely, Absolutely. And does it work for dust? Absolutely. Tell me about mold allergy in a house. Well, uh, certainly mold allergy is a big problem in homes, especially in, in the area where we live where the moisture levels are really high. Uh, anywhere where you can smell or see mold, you have very high levels of it. So if you get a mildew odor, you probably have high levels of it. Also remember to keep good circulation within your house. Uh, you need good airflow, especially if you travel and you're gonna leave the house empty, leave the fan going, keep that air circulating so you don't build up higher humidity levels and then grow mold in your home. Tell me about immunotherapy again and the allergy shots again, or tell me about how you identify with skin, how do you identify whether somebody's allergic to dust or mold? Well, we think skin tests, the gun. skin tests are the most effective way. You can actually see the reaction right there in the tissues. We get the results in 10 to 15 minutes. The patient knows uh, immediately what they're allergic to. We can go ahead and start the education on how to avoid it and be able to know exactly what to put in those allergy shots to immunize the patient against it. Your advice to patients that are allergic? Well, the, the advice is if you want to get rid of it, do the immunotherapy or move. Uh, and if you want to treat symptoms, uh, treat the symptoms. Uh, the avoidance measures, we educate people on avoidance measures, but the compliance tends to be pretty low. 
Ty, I've heard that you had allergies and you had allergy shots. Did they help you? I had allergy shots in 1964, Dr. Bob. They were glass syringes. Dr. Burton Rudolph here in town, he's still alive. Still, I believe, practices just a little bit, but uh, it, they were fantastic. I had allergies, asthma, and eczema, and it, within a year or two, they were gone. So it's very effective. We've been given allergy shots since the 1890s. There are recorded cases in the 1890s of doctors giving allergy shots, uh, so they've been around that long. Ty, you're a wonderful teacher. Thank you so much for coming to the Thank Dr. Thank you for Bob having me, show. Dr. Bob. It's always an honor. Great show. You're going to want to stay tuned. We're going to be talking about the power of statin drugs in that dry, wintry skin. A lot of information. I want to thank Dr. Ty Prince. Wonderful discussion on winter allergies, winter sinus, a lot more problems than you would think. And now for questions from you, the viewer, that I think will be important to your health. Question number one, Dr. Bob, my doctor wants me on statins. I have an elevated cholesterol, exercise and diet hasn't helped. Tell me about statins. Well, statins interfere with the production of cholesterol. So it's very simple, they're excellent. They will correct an elevated cholesterol and what they do is they lower the bad cholesterol. Remember, a cholesterol level, we know if your cholesterol is elevated, it can cause hardening of the arteries. There's a good cholesterol and a bad cholesterol. The statin drugs work to lower the bad cholesterol. They don't do very good at elevating the good cholesterol, although there are new medicines in the pipeline to do that. The power of statins. If we take two groups of people, both are normal, both have normal cholesterol, and we put one of those groups on statins and the other one not, the group that had normal cholesterol, both of them did, that was on the statins, had less cardiac problems, heart problems over the next 10 years. A lot of cardiologists are on statins. You might talk to your doctor about it. Question number two, Dr. Bob, dry winter skin, what do I do about it? Well, you know, in the warm months of the year, we're moisturizing our skin. It's nice and soft. We have normal oils that are there in the skin. But in the winter, when we bathe in the harsh winter skin, what it will do, it will dry out that skin. It takes away the normal oils that we have in the skin, especially bad in the hands, especially bad in the trunk, and especially bad in the feet. So that's almost all over. So what can we do? Well, let's talk about it. Moisturize, moisturize, moisturize. You can start with simple emollients that you can get over the counter. There are lots of excellent emollient creams that you can have to keep your skin nice and soft, keep your feet soft, keep the trunk soft. When you bathe, don't use harsh soaps. Don't use hot water. It will wash off those oils. So you can get non-alkaline soaps. There would be like basis soap. Uh, Dove, unscented Dove, doesn't have as much problem with harshness. It actually has some lotion. As soon as you get out of the bath, pat dry, and then apply your lotions right then. Well, what if that doesn't work? Or what if you get cracks in the skin? Or what if your feet start getting hard and rough? Well, then we have to step up. There's CeraVe. It has ceramides that gets in and to the deeper into the skin. It improves the integrity of the skin. It's a little bit more improved. It, it's a little bit more um, expensive. And then if we get cracks in the skin, there is CeraVe hand lotion. It's a healing lotion. It puts a barrier on the crack and lets things heal up from the outside. You may have to put the lotion on and put some gloves on at nighttime. You may have to put amlactin or lachydrin on the heels and put your socks over that. And what that will do is keep your skin soft and smooth and will heal up those cracks in the winter months of the year. So remember, moisturize, moisturize, moisturize. If we take a shower, make the water, the water tepid, uh, there's a vino bath oil. It, while you're still uh, soaking wet, you can put that on your hand and you can put that all over the body, pat dry, and then use your lotions. 
If it's not working, you see your dermatologist. When you see your dermatologist, they'll make sure that you're doing things and applying it properly. Simple things for dry skin will keep your skin nice and soft. That's all the time we have for you for this show. I hope you've enjoyed it like I have. Remember those four things that we need to be doing. Eight hours sleep, seven and a half hours sleep. If you're not sleeping well, talk to your doctor about why, but your seven hours of sleep will make you relax during the day. It'll make you think better. You'll perform better. You'll be happier. There's nothing like seven and a half hours of sleep. And exercise, we always say that's the most important, and it is. Lack of exercise in the United States is a huge problem. But exercise will help you lose the weight that you want. It'll lower your blood pressure. It'll lower stress. It'll make you feel better. It'll get off the pressure of your life. So be sure that you exercise, grab those tennis shoes, and get out the door and go for a nice walk. Eat properly. Eat less fried fatty foods. Start the day off with fruit and fiber and a good cereal. And during the day, have lettuce, less meats, almost no red meats. Decrease the amount of meat that you eat. More vegetables, more leafy vegetables. You'll get all your vitamins that way, and you'll be healthy. And most of all, what is it we like in the Dr. Bob Show? It's that laughter in your life. There's nothing like the power of laughter. Find that person that you love. Tell funny stories. Laugh a lot. Giggle, and you'll stay healthy. 